It was with a painful recollection that I attempt to tell this tale. Even now, the fever of the mind plagues my psyche in trying to recollect that horrid encounter in that dreadful cabin on that cursed mountain in 1948. Had I been a man of greater foresight, or perhaps a time traveler, I would have warned myself of the grievous travesties my small circle of friends and I were doomed to bring to fruition. My name is Edward Phillips. This is my tale of terror. In the early days of fall, the eastern coast of the United States begins to change. The leaves on the trees shift into a state of beautiful decay, causing the ever-present greenery to descend into a blissful amber, and many a man can be seen gawking in the general upright direction of these sights. Accompanying the intricate differences in fauna comes the drastic shift in climate temperatures that spreads like an icy weed over the coastline and inevitably inward toward the greater United States. The cold, the snow, that dreaded ice giant that stumbles out of the nothing to bring with it a cold so deep and unforgiving that it permeates the countryside far longer than wanted or expected. With such a bleak and even harrowing description of the East Coast, one wonders why a man may choose to live in a place so damn unforgiving. The truth is that the men and women who populate this area of America are of greater resilience than their mother nature, to their mother nature, and are some of the most pleasant individuals one can come across in life, if you'll believe it. They work hard for what they earn and ring true to the image of the ideal American. Many from outside the parameters of this area would insist that the man of the East challenges the great winter giant on a yearly basis, belittling and poking fun at the angry beast that controls his environment. Like a badge of honor, the hardy people of the eastern seaboard take great pride in the innumerable downsides of their habitat, and none, I dare say, are as kind-hearted as the ones who reside in the great state of New Hampshire, where my tale unfolds. New Hampshire, compared to a majority of other states, is a dismally small blip on the map, geographically speaking. However, if one were to find themselves within the expansion of its mountain ranges, they'd swear the place had no borders, only an endless realm of untamed wilderness and beauty. A frontier of palpable, primordial spectacles. No different from the rest of the state is the town of Franconia, who resides nearest the Echo Lake along the Highway 93, with very little as far as population goes. I was not a denizen of this area, but rather from the neighboring state of Massachusetts, within the small town of Marblehead. My close friend and esteemed colleague of Emerson College, also located in Massachusetts, Daniel Barker, had been birthed in the town of Revere. Daniel, however, was gifted the luxury of both parental figures originally from a wealthy area in Rhode Island, whose names elude me. Daniel had always had a modestly rich family, one who would probably look down upon my company as a man, simply for my choices in clothing and, of course, my wealth, or in this instance, lack thereof. They had always been an uptight lot of people with serpent-like qualities of character. Daniel was cut from a different slab. He was everything his family was not. To say that was he was a kind, charitable, and above all else, intrepid youth of twenty, with an appreciation for the stillness and serenity of nature. During our studies at Emerson College, we had both found a mutual interest in the confines of books and storytelling to the greatest degree of friendship, despite our social hierarchy being on opposite side of the spectrum. He was a tall, handsome fellow with a square jaw, a barrel chest, strikingly perfect hair, and unmistakable charisma. I myself was a bookish lad of 19 with circular spectacles, combed over brown hair and an average build. While some may say my features are handsome, I will never define myself in such a manner, as I no longer look in the mirror for fear of something looking back at me. Peculiar it was that Daniel and I would become so closely bonded over our time in school together 
that once a year, for the past three years at least, we would all venture up towards his family's luxurious cabin up in the hills of Cannon Mountain and enjoy the sights, drinking a variety of different ales and liquors, and of course, right to our heart's content, without the indignation of outside parties. The festivals occurred much to the chagrin of his mother and father, who swore up and down that myself and our other good friend Henry would corrupt his character. This current year, however, the family was quite adamant about allowing us time together, insisting that we get away for a while. This time we had decided the trip would take place in January. All of us were in concurrence with the notion and planning beginning in early December, but the trip itself only ever lasted three or four days at best. It was of the utmost importance to be prepared for an extended visitation should the weather change for the worse. This time of year, the snow falls heavily and consistently, burying the vast majority of the state in a blanket of fresh and clean crystallized powder. We had ample provisions stashed away in anticipation of our endeavor to the cabin, myself having prepared a large pack with various warm clothes, wool socks, a small box filled with miscellaneous medical supplies in case a member of our three-man party should sustain an unforeseen injury, and of course, a hefty amount of stationary implements for my intended writing. Daniel was a well-prepared lad who had brought a variety of different tools for survival in the great outdoors, such as flint, a folding shovel, matches, a barbaric-looking survival knife, and of course, a Krag Jorgensen carbine. This cut-down Norwegian weapon had been a gift from Daniel's grandfather when he had turned 17, and while I personally had no interest or notion of knowledge towards firearms. It made us all feel safer when alone in the woods, should some bear creature take too close a curiosity with us. Henry, of course, brought with him tools of inebriation. While only a male of twenty himself, he had developed a habitual liking into the bottle. Not so much that it controlled him, but closely enough for people to assume it all the same. Of course, each of us brought a respective pair of snowshoes. The drive was a slow and daunting one. Daniel's automobile, while something neither Henry or myself could dream to afford in the near future, was indeed an advantage. It was a treacherous drive riddled with uneasiness and a certain questioning of the mechanical dependency with which we transported ourselves, at least for Henry and myself. Daniel, as always, had maintained his supreme confidence in capabilities of mobility never once called into question his ability to take the icy roads by storm at speeds reasonably less safe than preferred. We parked the automobile in a dirt and snow-covered lot several miles south of our desired location, taken by foot into the hills and ascending into the mountains with gusto. So enthralled I felt by the winter surroundings that lavished the countryside. So carefully placed did the icicles form from the tips of trees so fresh the air was, so quiet and vast was the land we tread, so foolish I was to allow my friends the fate they would soon be given. After an hour or so of tiresome walking, we came to the cabin, which rested in between a somewhat open-fielded area at the base of one of Cannon Mountain and a thickly forested void. It was a splendid sight to see. Two floors in total were at structure, with only two doors, one on either end, and a long window overlapping the entirety of the valley-like landscape before us on one side. That night the chimney plumed with smoke of aged wood prepared and chopped by Daniel a month prior, and the cabin was alight with pleasant conversation between the best of friends. Merriments were had and stories we all knew and had retold infinite times prior were brought up in their endless cycle of humorous repetition as friends do. That night, I turned in early due to exhaustion from the hike here. As I ascended the immaculate wooden staircase, I peered down to Henry and Daniel, who of course were still going on about their travels and lives, pasts and futures. Had I known this would be the last night of solace we would all share together, I'd have at least stayed longer than I had. That night, I lay in my small guest bedroom, sitting up and gazing thoughtfully out the circular window 
at the bluish hue the moon cast upon the frigid wasteland that enveloped us. The trees were like golems of wood in the distance, still and undisturbed by our playful antics. Strangely, in all that vast stillness on the horizon, my eye was caught with the scarcest bit of movement within the far-off tree line. Blinking several times to adjust my eyes, perhaps seeing something that wasn't there, I focused outward again. There it was, slow-moving and large. A misshapen apparition haunted the distance. At the time, I had attempted to rationalize with myself, being a boy of many anxieties in childhood, a hunter, perhaps, a man of the woods who stalked at densities for sport. That had to be it. Just then, as I found myself coming to terms with my conclusion, the bulky anomaly halted. It was said once by my father that a man can feel when he's being watched, regardless of distance. And up until this moment in time, I had thought my father a fool for believing he had such superhuman senses. Yet here I was, feeling as though despite the ludicrous space between us, that this nameless thing had seen me, had locked eyes with me, and had stared back without the slightest notion of fear. Somewhere down the stairs, a bottle broke, followed by laughter, startling me enough to pull my eyes from the window temporarily. Naturally, when I looked back, I could make out no apparition or strange being gazing menacingly off in the snow somewhere. The only notion of difference now was that the wind had picked up considerably. I laid myself down to rest and thought no more of it. The next morning, I awoke, relatively early as the sun came up. Walking downstairs quietly to the larger living quarters, I noticed Henry lazily passed out on the old, long sofa that took up the most space in the cabin. Daniel was standing in the doorway, scratching his head. As I approached him to figure out why he looked so perplexed, my sensations were bombarded by the stench of death. I paused momentarily to analyze the scents which viciously overtook my nostrils. Reaching the door, Daniel was staring down at the carcass of some type of animal on the porch. A very young deer, perhaps. I had to turn away for a brief interlude trying not to expel whatever remained in my stomach from the night prior. Daniel stared at the poor creature with remorse and disgust simultaneously. I looked back once more at the amalgamation of dead flesh. It was a sickly sight. The animal's limbs were bent and contorted in disproportionate, painful, and unnatural ways. Its stomach had been spilled by several large slash marks, on the visible parts of its belly. The throat flapped and leaked dark blood. The fawn had a variety of misshapen sticks pushed inside its body that its snapped legs were wrapped around and its long, pulpy tongue stuck out of its mouth with a sickly, deep purple. No longer could I hold back. I ran past Daniel and into the snow, releasing my innards and tainting the white with bile. Soon, Henry had stirred and risen to much the same reaction as myself. He and Daniel removed the carcass soon after that, disposing of it in the thickness of woods not far away. That afternoon, the sun began to fall very quickly. The skies grayed within minutes and the wind howled furiously, and the wind howled ferociously. We came to the conclusion that whatever had performed that sickening display of torture could not have been some simple animal. The injuries were too brutal for a simple-minded predator to perform with such needless hate. This had to have been the doing of a man. A cruel man, surely. We decided that it would be best to head back to the vehicle first thing in the morning and return with haste to our respective homes for fear of some further harassment in the form of pointless cruelty. There was no telling of tales that night by the fire, no jostling of humorous intents that we all wanted, only an eerie suspicion that we were being watched from afar. And while any man could attest that no living human could survive the blizzard outside and live to tell the tale, I had a feeling in my gut 
that it was something beyond human that circled our cabin like prey. As we all drifted into uncomfortable sleep that night by the dying fire, uneasiness spread over us like a cancer. A dream came to me that night, one of great looming fear. Out in the cold distance, beneath the trees, I could see eyes. No ordinary eyes of man were these. They were a sickening red that had a dull lifelessness about them, a stare of foreboding utterances and dark promises. It knew I was scared, and it welcomed the idea, relished it even. This apparition sat motionless, cloaked in the shadow of the trees. Behind it, more eyes similar to the first opened up. A cluster of hateful and predatory vision cast itself at me, on me, into me. I could hear strange whispers in the dark of no known language, as if some ancient tongue shared between these faceless monstrosities was speaking and planning, but of what I know not. The feeling of being watched by some hateful pack of things lasted far longer in dream than I'd ever known a dream to last. As I felt I would spend an eternity locked in gaze with these creatures, a violent scream tore me from my mental prison. Henry, who was thrashing on the couch next to Daniel, had begun wailing in pain and fear. Both Daniel and I had sprung up immediately in confusion to try and awake him from his nightmare, only to find the normally quite skinny and frail lad to be overwhelmingly strong in his erratic movements. He began to shout, They're coming! They're coming! They're coming! He shouted. Daniel and I were both attempting to keep our composure, but managed to restrain our friend and shake him awake after the better part of five minutes had passed. When he finally awoke, he broke down into tears. We had little to offer him as far as comfort went, as Daniel and I found ourselves lost in a sense of directionless fear. When questioned as to what happened, he spoke of a vivid dream, or better nightmare, that he was trapped in for some amount of time. He went on about the hounds of the hills, the things he saw attempt to take him in his mind. It all made very little sense to us, until he had mentioned something about the eyes in the distance, to which I found a sense of icy recollection wash over me. Henry and I had experienced something of a similar experience, except his was far more long-lasting and detailed. Daniel's complexion had been made pale by our friend's ramblings, and as we both went into the small kitchen to get Henry something to drink, I questioned him about if he had a similar dream. We were left dumbfounded when we both came to the realization that all three of us had shared a similar night terror. That simply did not happen. Apparently my experience had been the least harrowing of the three of us with mine only reaching climax at the beginning of Daniel's ordeal, which apparently had lasted hours, which begins to question just how long Henry was trapped in his own mind. Daniel was feeling a bit ill-weathered, and I had noticed his hair looked longer and out of place, perhaps the result of his frightful sleep escapade. Upon return, Henry was curled up in the corner of the room, rambling on and on about the primordial pack, who sought new flesh for their growing family the dogmen of the mountain, who had been here long before the world of man, the ones who had terrorized the Native Americans, who had lived within the mountain for eons until they desired new blood, who had called to those unfortunate enough to hear their dream howls. At once I felt a mixture of emotions stirring in my mind. I simultaneously found myself pitying poor Henry for having such horrid visions forced into his gulliver, and yet a sense of relief that I had not been as unfortunate as him. He would not take the glass of water. He would not hear anything we said. He was not even here. Just as we were preparing to set Henry back to sleep on the couch, a powerful thud landed on the front door, then another, and then another, the third accompanied by a horrifying noise. So inhuman and evil was the gurgle below that I found myself sweating at a sicilic rate. Backing away from the door, Henry had begun to clutch his temples and open his mouth as though he were screaming, but no noise escaped him. Daniel quickly retrieved and loaded his rifle, pointing it at the door. 
I had no weapon what to defend myself with. What felt like hours passed, Henry was still mumbling something to himself. Don't fall asleep, Daniel, he said. That's how they turn you. Don't fall asleep. They want you, Daniel. I rushed over and plugged Henry's mouth with my hand for fear of Daniel shooting him. His madness had truly driven him to a deep insanity. But there was no denying I felt the urge to heed his words. By the time Daniel had lowered his rifle, it was somewhere around one in the morning, and we were suddenly feeling a wave of exhaustion. The wind still echoed eerily in the distance outside. My mind swirled with possibilities and the faint possibility of our death was approaching, and yet I found my eyelids curiously heavy. Daniel was resting his back against the fireplace, which now housed only hot embers. I attempted to keep Henry awake, as I noticed he had already drifted to sleep, his lips still chattering wordlessly. Shaking him did no good. Slapping him had no effect. I turned to Daniel. If we were going to come out of this, the person with the gun would be the best one to remain sane. I crawled over to him with great effort, trying so hard not to pass out. My limbs held the weight of someone three times my size. Daniel had begun to flutter at the eyelids, and as I found myself too weak to reach him, I lay my face down, catching a glimpse of something watching me in the window as my eyes shut on their own. My screams internalized due to the helpless state my physical body had been left in. I dreamed again drifting through the endless mire of the mind. Now the eyes in the distance became clearer. The misshapen denizens of the mountain took a step out of the darkness, perhaps finally piercing the last metal barrier that held them back, and approached our sanctum of the cabin. Slowly they came. Some walked upright and dignified, others on all fours more akin to the beasts they looked like. They were not always proportionate, and were in some areas sickly thin, while others muscular and strapping. The darkness still shrouded them almost entirely, making features hard to distinguish with exception to the large ears and hellish red eyes, transfixed on myself and my friends, who were staring motionlessly out in the front of the porch, unable to move our bodies in the slightest. They were everywhere, and from all angles, the closer they came through the howling wind and snow, the more I found myself growing colder and colder. The pale moon, somehow shining its light upon the beasts, made only worse our situation, as blindness would have been preferred to watching your doom encroach. Just before the pact closed in completely, outstretched their clawed hand and exposed a set of jagged sharp teeth from a mouth so unnaturally wide. I awoke. I was back in the guest bedroom. At once I threw myself out of the comfort of my bed and looked out the window. Nothing. Not even the wind. But I was not convinced. There was no possible dream so vivid as this. So deep with memory and detail. Unless I was still asleep. I'm not sure to this day what was a dream and what was not. I cautiously walked down the stairs, praying for some form of relief in the sight of my friends, hoping against hope that they were of sound mind and body. Henry lay motionless on the couch in sleep. The rifle rest against the fireplace. The door was partially open. Daniel was nowhere to be seen. Hurriedly, I rushed over to shut the door to separate ourselves from the frozen hellscape. I walked over to the other side of the cabin, where the largest window was, and attempted to pour myself a glass of water from the small kitchen. It was a much welcomed drink. I gaze out of the large glass window, feeling a sense of what I hesitated to call relief. There were still many questions to be answered. Most prominent of them all was our friend Daniel's whereabouts. The only logical explanation was that Daniel had awoken before myself and Henry and decided to put us both to sleep in our respective beds. That was just like him, a kind man even in such a dismal, bleak scenario, but where was he? A large, clawed hand slapped against the thick glass of the cabin window, 
causing me to jump back, raising itself to level with my vision. My greatest fear was made reality. The eyes and teeth of the dream beast had focused on me yet again. This time, I finally got a look at the thing, though in all my mind I wish I hadn't. It was a hideous, primeval creature. Its skin was a dark, oily blue, with even darker blue patches of long, mangy hair. Its large ears were canine in nature, but not like that of a lichen of myth, but something more unnatural and gut-wrenching. Its flat face exhibited small nasal passages, and it carried with it a sickly smile on its outstretched maw. Many of them began to appear on the window, slamming their powerful hands against the glass in anger and hateful frustration. The now wavering, cracked glass was the only thing separating my frail mortal body from these ancient monstrosities. They growled and gurgled and howled into the night, as the glass was soon to give way. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and I made back to the living room where Henry was still asleep. I attempted to wake him in vain yet again, only for the front door to fly off its hinges. It was Daniel, or at least what had become of Daniel. His arms were stretched out thin and long, covered in tufts, covered in tufts of bluish hair, with hands ending in long-nailed fingers. His mouth was not his. The jaw of my friend was now unhinged and stretched downward, in a sickening display of dripping boiling salivation and rows upon rows of strong, sharp teeth. His shirt was torn and tattered and his shoes were absent. Daniel attempted to writhe and stumble forward towards us, gripping at his temple with one hand and stretching out the other in a grabbing gesture, as if half his mind were fighting the other half to retain his humanity. I called out to him, pleading with him to resist, to stop. He did not. He lurched forward, eyes disapprovingly twitching involuntarily. One sat and somber, one sad and somber, the other sunken, red, and straining forward with an indescribable pain. A crack pierced the air, and Daniel dropped to the floor, blood oozing from a silver dollar-sized hole in his skull. To my shock, I turned to see Henry, brandishing our friend's rifle and twitching uncontrollably. He turned the rifle towards me in a fit of frightened retaliation should I have met a similar fate as Daniel. I had not. We stared at each other for a brief interlude as he lowered the gun. They got him, Edward. They got him. They wanted him. I'm sorry. He spoke in such a somber tone, racked with guilt for his murderous deeds. He began to cry. I'm, I'm sorry too, Henry. I said somberly. The glass in the kitchen finally gave way, much to our surprise. From within the cramped kitchen now scrambled a horrific thrashing mess of the predatory assailants surely coming to either eviscerate us, or worse, turn us into one of them. Henry fired another shot into the kitchen. Run, Edward. For God's sakes, run for the car. Henry screamed at me as he continued to fire into the mound of hellish beast men. I didn't hesitate, and for this reason alone, I consider myself a coward. I turned and ran out the front door only for Daniel to grab at my leg. Somewhere, still alive after a bullet through the cranium. His touch was one of icy, hellish hands that sent a splintering pain into my body. With the knife in hand, I slashed at his hand in a fury of strikes, screaming, nearly severing my former friend at the wrist and rushing out into the blizzard. Behind me, the unnatural wailing of hate and bellowing of monstrosities was matched with the ever-prevalent gunshot. As I faded into the blinding snow 
and headed down the mountain through the moonlit darkness. The sounds of Henry firing the rifle faded into nothingness. I ran for what must have been hours, aimless and lost in a northeastern blizzard without so much as a jacket to prevent my ultimate demise, without so much as a jacket to prevent my untimely demise. From behind me, the echoes of the dogmen filled the night. They were after me for sure. It was only when I reached the road of unspecified origin that a passing policeman had found me. I was a hyperthermia riddled, pale ghost of a man clutching a bloody knife in a snowstorm, rambling about monsters and the death of my friends. When I was finally subdued and brought into hospital care, I was questioned by the police about what had transpired on the mountainside. The tale I told, this one, was enough to land me within the psychiatric ward of Greater Massachusetts. The trial for my friend's disappearance and subsequent murder, which I felt which I fear I will most certainly be found guilty for, takes place in the following weeks. The police returns to the cabin several days later, only to find it completely empty, albeit with signs of a struggle and broken glass littering the ground. Sitting in my padded cell, I hesitate to sleep for fear of what I may become. I have been disowned by my family for my madness and ostracized by society. But I know, I know what lurks out in the wilderness, and I know that I will never be free of the image of that thing that plagues my mind. What purpose they serve eludes me. They are beyond me or your understanding. Their motives are their own. I will always fear them for the remainder of my days. Those ancient evil earth devils, those hateful unnatural things, the hounds of the hills, the eyes in the distance, the dogmen of Cannon Mountain.